On July 18, 1984, a devastating act of violence shook the quiet town of San Isidro, California. In what would become one of the deadliest mass shootings in American history, a former U.S. Marine named James Huberty entered a local McDonald's restaurant and opened fire on the unsuspecting patrons inside. Over the course of 77 horrific minutes, Huberty methodically gunned down 21 innocent people and injured 19 others. 41-year-old James Huberty told his wife Etna that he thought he was mentally unstable. Two days later, on the 17th of July, James called the psychiatric hospital to request an appointment and left his contact details. Due to James's polite communication on the phone, the hospital operator did not consider this request urgent, and therefore James's request for psychological help was granted within 48 hours. It turned out that it had been left to be assessed at the time James was expecting to get a call back from hospital staff on the same day. He had been sitting by the phone for several hours waiting for them to call. But when he didn't get a call from the hospital, he suddenly left the house and set off on his motorbike in an unknown direction. About an hour later, James returned home in good spirits, and after lunch, he and his wife and two daughters rode their bicycles to a nearby park. In the evening of the same day, James watched a film with his wife. On the morning of Wednesday, the 18th of July, James took his wife and daughters to the San Diego Zoo. Walking through the zoo, he told his wife that he thought his life was over. He mentioned the psychiatric hospital's refusal to recall James the previous day. He said he gave society a chance. One day, after lunch at McDonald's, the Herbert family returned home. Shortly after arriving home, James approached his wife lying on the bed, leaned towards her, and said, I want to kiss you goodbye. When Edna asked where he was going, James said, I'm going hunting. I'm going on a manhunt, walking towards the door of the house and carrying some items wrapped in blankets. James looked at his eldest daughter, Zelia, and said goodbye. I'm not coming back. James got into the black sedan and drove down San Cedro Boulevard, stopping at a Big Bear supermarket and then going to the post office. At about 15, 56 hours, James pulled into the car park of a McDonald's restaurant near his home on San Cedro Boulevard. James packed a Browning high power pistol, an Uzi submachine gun, a Winchester 1200 shotgun, and a cloth bag filled with hundreds of rounds of ammunition for each weapon. There were 45 people in the McDonald's restaurant at the time, and they had only minutes to come face to face with the ruthless monster. Entering the restaurant minutes later, Huberty first aimed his shotgun at a 16-year-old employee named John Arnold from a distance of approximately 15 feet. As he did so, the assistant manager, Guillermo Flores, shouted, Hey, John, that guy's going to shoot you. According to Arnold, when Huberty pulled the trigger, nothing happened. As Huberty inspected his gun, the manager of the restaurant, 22-year-old Neva Kane, walked toward the service counter of the restaurant in the direction of Arnold, as Arnold, believing the incident to be a distasteful joke, began to walk away from the gunman. Huberty fired his shotgun toward the ceiling before aiming the Uzi at Kane, shooting her once beneath her left eye. Kane died minutes later. Immediately after James Hubert killed the restaurant manager, he shot John Arnold, an employee of the restaurant, in the chest with a shotgun and then told everyone in the restaurant to get down on the floor, telling everyone in the restaurant that the filthy pigs had killed thousands of people and would kill thousands more. Victor Rivera, a 25-year-old customer of the restaurant, tried to persuade James Huberty not to fire again. James responded by firing at Victor 15 times, shouting at him to shut up. As staff and customers tried to hide beneath tables and service booths, Huberty turned his attention toward six women and children huddled together. He first killed 19-year-old Maria Colmanero Silva with a single gunshot to the chest, 
then fatally shot nine-year-old Claudia Perez in the stomach, cheek, thigh, hip, leg, chest, back, armpit, and head with his Uzi. He then wounded Perez's 15-year-old sister Imelda, once in the hand with the same weapon, and fired upon 11-year-old Aurora Pena with his shotgun. Pena, initially wounded in the leg, had been shielded by her pregnant aunt, 18-year-old Jackie Reyes. Huberty shot Reyes 48 times with the Uzi. Beside his mother's body, eight-month-old Carlos Reyes sat up and wailed, whereupon Huberty shouted at the child, then killed the infant with a single pistol shot to the center of the back. James then went round the whole area inside the restaurant and started shooting at all the restaurant customers who were hiding under tables and behind other furniture, many of whom were seriously injured, ranging in age from 10 to 75 years old. Many of these people were desperately and bravely trying to protect their families and friends, heroically defending each other from gunfire, but the ruthless James set out to kill everyone around him. The first of many 9-11 emergency calls was answered at around 4 p.m., but the operator who answered the call directed the police team to another McDonald's restaurant three kilometers away from the wrong scene police officers, responded to the address error fairly quickly, but it took them 10 minutes to reach the correct address. This mistake increased the opportunity for James Huberty to kill as many innocent lives as possible. As the police were arriving at the scene, a young woman named Lydia Flores drove her car into the McDonald's car park, stopped by the window to order food, noticed the broken glass, and heard gunshots. When she looked out of the window, she saw a criminal firing a gun, and in a panic, she quickly reversed the accelerator pedal of her car and hit a fence. Afraid to get out, she hid in the car with her two-year-old daughter and sat there until the shooting was over. A few minutes after the incident, three 11-year-old boys then rode their BMX bikes into the west parking lot. Hearing a member of the public yell something unintelligible from across the street, all three hesitated, before Huberty shot the three boys with his shotgun and Uzi. Joshua Coleman fell to the ground, critically wounded in the back, arm, and leg. He later recalled looking toward his two friends, Omar Alonso Hernandez and David Flores Delgado, noting that Hernandez was on the ground with multiple gunshot wounds to his back and had started vomiting. Delgado had received several gunshot wounds to his head. Coleman survived. Hernandez and Delgado both died at the scene. Huberty next noticed an elderly couple, 74-year-old Miguel Victoria Uloa and 69-year-old Aida Velasquez Victoria, walking toward the entrance. As Miguel reached to open the door for his wife, Huberty fired his shotgun, killing Ada with a gunshot to the face and wounding Miguel. An uninjured survivor, Oscar Mondragon, later reported observing Miguel cradling his wife in his arms and wiping blood from her face, shouting curses at Huberty, who then approached the doorway, swore at Miguel, then killed him with a shot to the head. Back inside the restaurant, James approached the service counter and tried to tune the portable radio to a news channel to hear news about the crime he had committed. Finding no news, James left the music on and started dancing as he continued to shoot people around him a few minutes later. When he entered the kitchen of the restaurant, he saw six serving staff there, shouting at them that there was more here and that they were trying to hide from me after which he shot all the people in the kitchen with a shotgun. These workers were all between the ages of 17 and 21, four of whom died immediately on the spot. After James left the kitchen, the two badly wounded young girls managed to escape to the back room, waiting for the shooting to stop. At some point, Aurora Pena, one of the first victims of the shootout, noticed a lull in the fighting. When she opened her eyes, she saw James Hoban standing nearby. Seeing Aurora regain consciousness, James swore at her and threw a box of fries at her and shot her in the arm, neck and jaw with a shotgun. Despite all the wounds, Aura managed to survive, 
but her treatment took longer than anyone else injured in the restaurant. After the clock showed 1610, police officers arrived at the correct address of the McDonald's restaurant. The first police officer to arrive at the scene, Miguel Rosario do Rosario, realized the extent of the crime that was being committed after seeing James shooting at the police car and quickly relayed the information to the San Diego Police Department. Within a few minutes, reinforcements from a large number of police teams arrived on the scene. They closed the entire area around the scene and set up a command center two blocks away from the restaurant. 175 police officers were strategically placed around the scene. Initially, the police did not know how many criminals were inside the McDonald's restaurant. Because James had used different types of firearms, and often fired rapidly, the reflections of the glass fragments made it more difficult for the police to observe the incident from a distance as most of the windows of the restaurant were broken by bullets. And the police were concerned that there were one or more criminals inside the restaurant and that they might have hostages. One of the people who escaped from the restaurant during the incident told the police that there was only one criminal inside the McDonald's building who was not holding a hostage, but was shooting at everyone he encountered. At around 17 o'clock, Police officers were joined by members of the SWAT team who took up positions around the McDonald's restaurant. At 17.05, all police officers and SWAT team members arriving at the scene were given permission by the San Diego Police Department to kill the criminal inside the McDonald's. 27-year-old police officer and SWAT team member Charles Foster settled on the roof of the post office, about 32 meters from the scene. At 5.17 p.m., Charles Foster had a clear view of James Hubbard's neck and upper torso for a few seconds, and then fired a shot at him. The bullet struck James in the chest, tearing the oort vein below the heart and exiting the spine, causing a wound six centimeters wide. James Huberty fell to the ground in front of the restaurant's service counter and died a few seconds later. The tragedy created by James occurred for 77 minutes, and during this time, he shot at least 257 times. 21 people died in the incident, 17 of whom were shot inside the restaurant, and four on the street near McDonald's. Only 10 people inside the restaurant, six of whom were hiding in the back room, escaped unhurt. Some of the injured tried to stop the bleeding from their wounds with paper handkerchiefs, but of course all their attempts failed. The ages of the dead and injured ranged from 4 to 74 years old. Most of these people were of Mexican or Mexican-American descent, which was in keeping with the local demographic structure. According to a witness who remained alive, during the commission of the offense, James Huberty shouted accusations and gestures before shooting people. At one point in the incident, James shouted that he didn't deserve to live but that he would take care of it himself. Also, James repeatedly stated that he was a Vietnam veteran when he was shooting, but he had never actually served in the military. According to initial reports of the incident released by the San Diego Police Department, all of the people injured or killed in the McDonald's restaurant were shot by James within the first 10 and 15 minutes of his arrival at the restaurant, a claim strongly denied by the survivors of the incident. They said James fired for 40 minutes, repeatedly shooting at people who were wounded and lost their lives. James Oliver Huberty was born on the 11th of October, 1942, in Canton, Ohio. He was the second child of the family. His father, Earl Vincent, worked as a food inspector, and his mother, Ikle Huberty, was a housewife. Both parents were extremely religious people, and his family regularly attended local churches. James contracted a serious viral infection called poliomyelitis. When he was three years old, James had to wear steel and leather braces on both legs throughout his childhood due to this disease. As James grew older, he gradually began to recover, and the disease almost disappeared. However, for the rest of his life, he also suffered from a slight limp and had difficulty walking. In the early 1950s, his father, Vincent, bought a farm in the village of Mount Eaton. 
His mother, Eichel, decided to leave the family, refusing to live in the countryside. After moving to Arizona, he became a street missionary. The departure of his mother from the family had a devastating effect on James. Emotionally, James's character was very withdrawn and he had few friends. His favorite hobby was target shooting with a pistol. He had a problem with his leg. Because of his deeply religious family and his eccentric personality, James was often bullied during his high school years. In 1962, James enrolled at Mellon College, where he studied sociology, but later changed his course of study and enrolled at the Institute of Mortuary Science in Pittsburgh, from which he graduated with honors in 1964 and received his mortuary director's license the following year. In 1965, he married Etna Markland, whom he met while attending Mellon College. After his marriage, James Cantona started working at a funeral home James Embalming. Although he did his job well, he had many problems with customers at work due to his introverted nature and had minor conflicts with his superiors at work. After working in this job for two years, James decided to change his career and became a welder for a Louisville company. After two more years, he found a better paid job as a welder for a company called Babcock and Wilcox. Although James was reserved and reticent, his employers considered him a very reliable employee. James never had a problem working overtime and getting promotions, so that by the mid-1970s, he was regularly earning between $25,000 and $30,000 a year. Nowadays, that amount is considered to be between $142,000 and $171,000. James had a good and stable financial situation. This house in Ohio burned down in a fire in the winter of 1971, and James and his wife bought another house on the same street. Shortly afterwards, they built an apartment block with six flats in place of their first house, which burnt down and they became the managers of this apartment block. The Hirti couple had a daughter, Zalia, in 1972, and a daughter, Cassandra, in 1974. James had physically abused members of the family. He was violent towards his daughters, sometimes holding a knife to their throats, and he was also violent towards his wife. Edna had tried on several occasions from 1976 onwards to persuade her husband to see a psychiatrist but James had refused to seek psychiatric help. James's neighbors, colleagues, and acquaintances described him as a disgruntled, irritable, and paranoid person. According to them, James was a pearl, and any insult directed at him he would always try to retaliate or retaliate, but due to his nervous nature, he took many things as insults. James believed in a worldwide conspiracy and was always ready to fight for his survival. He believed that the Cold War would turn into an apocalypse, and even that the U.S. government was conspiring against him. He believed that the Soviet Union was a great threat to the world, and that there would be an economic crisis and nuclear war because of the Soviet government. James considered himself responsible for preparing for the coming apocalypse, and therefore filled his house with plenty of non-perishable food and a large number of weapons. According to an acquaintance of his family, James's house was full of firearms, so much so that James could reach a gun from anywhere in his house just by reaching out his hand. Each of the firearms was loaded, and the safety on the gun was off. His wife Edna had tried several times to calm her husband's nervous and anxious state. She had tried to influence and control James's behavior. So Etna convinced him that she could read that she could calm her husband down in some situations, and James believed her. He started listening to Ida read tarot cards, and this method sometimes calmed him down. In November 1982, James was laid off from his high-paying job due to the closure of the company. He became depressed due to his inability to provide for his family as before. At the time of his layoff, James said that if he could not provide for his family, he planned to end his life and take everyone with him to the other world. According to Edna, James started hearing voices in his head after being fired from his job in 1983. 
One day, James threatened to end his life with a loaded gun to his forehead. Edna managed to talk her husband out of it, but James later said he should have let me shoot myself. Unable to find a regular job in Ohio, James sold his six-unit apartment building for $115,000 and bought a small house. But James's failures did not end there. A few months later, he and one of his daughters were involved in a car accident. After the accident, James noticed an increase in neck pain, which he had tolerated since childhood, and also began to experience frequent nervous tremors in his hands. In the summer of 1983, the Hubbard couple applied for a residence in Mexico, believing that living in Mexico would be easier than living in the United States with the money they would receive from the sale of their apartment building. In October of that year, the Hubbard family moved to Tijuana, Mexico. His wife Etna and his daughters quickly got used to the new place, made friends with the locals, and felt comfortable. But James was not happy with everything. He could not speak Spanish well. He was rude to his neighbors and was annoyed by everything around him. After living in the city for only three months, in January 1984, James and his family returned to the United States and moved to San Diego, California, where they settled in the impoverished neighborhood of San Cedro, close to the northern border with Mexico. James found a job as a security guard and began renting an apartment on Everill Street. This apartment was 180 meters from the McDonald's restaurant where he committed the brutal murder on the 18th of July. In addition, James had been fired from his job a week earlier for his crime. After the tragedy on the 18th of July, McDonald's temporarily suspended all television and radio advertising for several days. Within two days after the incident, the McDonald's restaurant was repaired and the bosses of the restaurant even planned to reopen the restaurant. However, the local authorities decided that no more restaurants should be opened in that location. On the 26th of September, 1984, this McDonald's was completely demolished. The McDonald's restaurant chain donated $1 million to a fund to help survivors of the local attack on the 18th of July. McDonald's founder, Ray Kroc, also made a personal contribution of $100,000 to the fund. The total donation to the fund was over $1.4 million. The money from the fund was distributed to the families of the dead and injured. A college was built on the site of the destroyed McDonald's. One of the students of this college designed a memorial to honor the victims of the McDonald's, and this memorial was built in 1990. This memorial consists of 21 hexagonal white marble columns, each of which is inscribed with the name of the deceased. On each anniversary of the tragedy, local people bring flowers to this memorial. Local San Diego residents strongly condemned the local police for their slow response to the incident, as the criminal was not neutralized until 67 minutes after the first police officers arrived on the scene. On the 2nd of August, 1984, San Diego Police Chief William Collander held a press conference on the issue. The police officers arriving at the scene initially did not know the details of the incident, or how many criminals were in the restaurant building they were prohibited from shooting at the assailant until the SWAT team arrived. In addition, the police teams surrounding the scene were not sufficiently armed to properly and safely confront the offender. After the McDonald's incident, San Diego City authorities increased the training of local police units and provided firearms to arm the police. Many police officers who witnessed James's crime suffered psychological problems after the incident, and special psychological counseling sessions were organized for them. In the weeks following the tragedy, James's wife and daughters received numerous death threats from some local residents. Therefore, Etna and daughters had to live temporarily at a friend's house. Etna and daughters attended counseling sessions with a psychologist for over nine months. In 1986, Edna filed a $5 million lawsuit against McDonald's and Babcock and Wilcox, where her husband worked as a welder. The lawsuit alleged that James's actions resulted from eating substandard food at the McDonald's restaurant chain and poisoning his body with highly toxic metals, 
during the 14 years he worked as a welder at Babcock and Wilcox. According to Anna, James's poisoning had caused him to hallucinate. An autopsy was performed on James's body, and the results of the autopsy showed that James had high levels of lead and cadmium in his body, which supported Ita's hypothesis that James had been poisoned by inhaling toxic metal vapors while working as a welder. But this fact did not help him win the case. In 1987, the court dismissed Etna's case, and after a while, Etna and her daughters moved to another city, and her daughters enrolled in a local school under pseudonyms. In 2003, Etna Hubbard died of breast cancer. Information about the lives of his daughters is currently unknown.